Welcome back to Cinema Flicks and Music Picks. I'm Davey, your host with the most, the beast with the least. The least we can do today is say hello to the new subscribers who've joined, subsequent to my appearance on Sea of Tranquility, which was an honour and a privilege. Um, I'm looking forward to future appearances, um, and it went down rather well. So I'll stick a link in the comments for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it's... Um, wonderful um, music channel. I'm sure most people here will be aware of it, but it's um, Pete Pardo's music channel, in which he covers all things classic rock, prog rock, jazz fusion, metal, and whatnot. Um, so I won't go into everything he covers because Pete puts out about three shows a day sometimes. It's uh, insane. Um, so that was an honour. Um, and then I just took a week off last week. Um, I had a bit of, a bit of a Bit of a run in with the, um, you know, you know, slap, stole this from Will Smith, it all kicked off from there. You'll, you'll read about it in the papers, don't worry. Anyway, um, it's Wednesdays and we missed it last week. But what do we do on Wednesdays? It's Box Hit Wednesdays, isn't it? So I thought, well, we'll pick one that's kind of uh, see a tranquility ish, um, nice easy one just to say hello and welcome aboard to any new people and since I've not covered them on the channel before really um, so we're going to cover and it never shows up well on camera this because it's all so black but yeah, that, that's not too bad um, The Black Sabbath, The Black Box 1970 to 1978 this is something of a sentimental um, item for me because these CDs I have better editions of with bonus tracks. In some cases, I've got the box set versions with the Steve Wilson remixes and things. But this was my first real um, Black Sabbath purchase. I think I had, um, yeah, I had Volume 4 first and then I had Paranoid. Um, but then this was announced in 2000, and, I want to say late 2003. So it had been about 18, um, and then it came out at the start of 2014. So, uh, sorry, 2004, so it'd be 18 going on 19. Um, so, what is it? Well, as you can imagine, it's simply the classic era of Black Sabbath um, from Ozzy's first tenure. So it's just the albums, no bonus tracks here. So really, this is just one that's for the collector and or somebody like myself who just had it at the time and it was quite something to get them all in one place so nice band shots as you can see what they've done here they've put them in two packets here and it's essentially the original eight so you get two folders again with nice embossing but you, you struggle to see but they have went to the effort of even saying you know this is the 70 to 72 um, and then the way they're presented and I'll do a run through of each as we go through, just my thoughts on them, because I'm a little bit contrarian with uh, Black Sabbath. Um, so we, of course, start with just a self-titled Black Sabbath. Always always good for a pub quiz question if they ask for a band who had um, the band name, the album name, and a song name all on an album. Um, so Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath is on the album Black Sabbath, you know. Um, just like Iron Maiden by Iron Maiden is on the album Iron Maiden. Um, so this of course was their debut. Um, and these all come as little digipacks. Um, so that you have the classic uh, spooky kind of cover. It's uh, very, very dark and moody, isn't it? Um, and, and they've replicated the, the vinyl, um, you know, with the side rather than print tracks right down it. Um, so, you know, I mean, it starts with that, of course, that famous, um, I can't remember the name of it, but that famous chord that is um, considered evil by some, but it's, um, you know, the, the chord from the opening of Black Sabbath itself. Um, and then we've got, you know, that the wizards, great on here, Wicked World's fantastic. Um, and then we've got that kind of, over here, it was released as one kind of side um, nine minute track, but I think in America they split it up, didn't they? Because they rearranged this in America um, to have little Wasp and NIB all separate, um, so it looked as if you were getting more 
tracks for your money kind of thing um, but that's that's a cool suite um, although you wouldn't have it if you only have the American original version um, and I think there was a different track in America on the original as well but this although it only gives you uh, the UK back does have the extra track so it, it doesn't skimp there so this is the debut um, quite revelatory in its day um, 1970 obviously you have things like Deep Purple and Rock and you've got Very Heavy, Very Humble from Uriah Heep. So we're seeing the birth of what we would know as, you know, the real start of metal and real heavy rock as opposed to just classic rock and things. Um, so the blues were starting to disappear from, from rock inspirations. Although, to be fair, on quite a lot of this there's still some very bluesy inspiration on, on Naomi's playing in particular. Um, and then very shortly afterwards, recorded at the same sessions, uh, pretty much, um, you get Paranoid, which again was one of the first I owned, with the cover that's at once awful and on the other hand iconic at the same time. Famously it was supposed to be called War Pigs with this gentleman here representing War Pig. Um, it doesn't come across with the name Paranoid, um, but they didn't have the time to change the cover. I don't think calling it War Pigs would have made much of a difference anyway. And it's one of those ones where a bad album cover has kind of escaped that because it's just become iconic because of the, the tracks themselves. So, I mean, this is almost like a greatest hits. I mean, you have War Pigs with, um, you know, the... the witches gather in their masses and th you know that's a great opera isn't it it's, it's very um a bit like um, run through the jungle or something it's very much one of those tracks that you'll always see on the soundtrack to a vietnam movie if they want to quickly establish the scene and the feel of something um paranoid obviously is uh, overplayed done to death but if you can hear it in the right mood it can still have a little bit of power um, but it's got that kind of stairway to heaven thing where you, you, it's hard for us to appreciate now because we've just heard it so many times planet caravan iron man's kind of the same as um as paranoid where it's a great song but it's just been overheard um and then side two or you know on here it's just one cd uh, but side two Oh, and by the way, I should be showing you the, the inserts. The CDs all have the original um, typeface and whatnot as well for the... Again, they've done it so black. There's none more black. Um, but um, side two... Oh, and I should... They all, they also give you the, the... If there's a gate forward, they can replicate that. Um, it is a bit like side two of Moving Pictures by Rush, where... Initially, it was side one that I thought was, you know, the, the belter. And then, just through being overplayed, and you listen to side two a bit more, that's where I kind of go to. And it's a hand of doom I love, that's very much. I'm speaking of Vietnam, rat salad's cool fun. Um, I do like those those weird uh, things that Geezer came up with. And then Fadies Wear Boots was kind of their um, mandrake root or something, speaking of deep purple, something they could expand live. Um, and became quite a quite a, a an epic um, in live shows, but you know these first two albums are so iconic in the catalogue. But they're not my go-to Iron, uh, Iron Maiden. They're certainly not my go-to Iron Maiden albums. They're, these are rubbish Iron Maiden albums. Pretty good Sabbath albums, um, but um, yeah, I like them. I don't love them as much as I used to. And I think again, part of that has been overplayed, and part of that is just my appreciation for the others going up. So of course to finish this part of the, the two for off, uh, Master of Reality, which I still think is, is one of the great album covers just for pure simplicity, um, but with a kind of OTT typeface and whatnot, you know, it doesn't care about kerning, it just, you know, it, it's, it's very much just in your face, here's what we are, take it, like it or lump it. Um, and Again, they always went with these kind of, you know, almost off kilter and out of focus and um, filtered um, band shots. You know, it's quite difficult to actually get decent band shots of them in these early albums. Um, um, so we start with Sweet Leaf, which obviously was about, um, and I remember reading Tony saying that it was, uh, that's what they were all into at the time. If only they'd stayed just into that. They may have had a <laughs> slightly better time if it had gone forward, but they all got into 
<sighs> shortly after and uh, hmm. Um, after Forever is Lovely, I mean that's a nice, uh, one of their nicer ones, and then you get the Embryo Instrumental. I'm not always crazy about their instrumentals, um, but a lot of these early ones do have some nice showcases for Bill Ward. Um, so he gets to kind of show his chops on a lot of the instrumentals, and I think he's quite underrated in terms of, you know, he finds um, some really good fills, and he finds some good uh, places to add snare instead of the, the toms and whatnot and i think he does quite a lot of that um in these albums children of the grave is obviously one of their great epics um one of their really heavy stomping tunes um i think that's that's um who quoted that as a favorite i was reading uh quite a few obviously but um was it rob halford i mean there was there was quite a few real heavy metal audience who cited that and this album in particular as being the one that made them want to get into music so this made them like Black Sabbath but this is the one that kind of made them say I'd like to be Black Sabbath which is quite interesting because it doesn't have quite the iconic tracks um, in the public imagination and then side two again Orchid is an instrumental um, Lord of This World Cool Solitude Into the Void um, Into the Void is one of the more lyrical tracks um, that Giza wrote in this period um, and it's quite quite dark and disturbing which again goes with the Sabbath ethos at this time but they quickly wanted to move out of that because they were starting to get this reputation which didn't service them well going forward in America of just being evil um, and you know as Kiss found out you can kind of play that to your advantage if you're not really you know coming across that way and, you know what if you get the chance you can actually put on a primetime TV special and hey we're in an amusement park and there's robots but we'll beat them don't worry but Sabbath they couldn't really do that because they were just a bit too rough around the edges if you stuck Ozzy in front of a camera, he's never going to be as corporate as a Gene Simmons or whatnot. Um, so he, he, that's why he needed a Sharon later on. Imagine Sharon and Gene Simmons hooked up at one point. God, they would have conquered the world. Um, and that, of course, takes us into to Volume 4, which for a lot of people is their Black Sabbath iconic album. Again, I want to be a little bit controversial here and say I think this is the most overrated of the Sabbath albums. Cool live shot in the in the middle though um, but I think this now to say it's overrated doesn't mean I don't like it it just means I think it's not as good as some people do um, and again it keeps you know the original backing so the, the tracks are tiny um, so Wheels of Confusion is cool uh, I like Tomorrow's Date Dead Dream actually Changes I never need to hear again in my life doesn't matter you know I just find it so out of place and that's that's a real concession to that all that we can actually do something else but without any kind of interesting notion or dexterity whatsoever they'd go into the same kind of idea with it later on in the catalogue in this box and we'll, we'll see that in a minute Snowblind's really good I love Snowblind um, and that's where they're starting to talk more about moving away from Sweet Leaf and into the yeah um, Cornucopia again I do like um, Laguna Sunrise and Vitas Dance and Under the Sun yeah there's some obviously some great Iommi riffs here I mean if nothing else you're always going to get with especially early Sabbath great Iommi riffs you're going to get some really cool um, if sometimes out of key uh, Aussie singing um, it, it's, sometimes they'll do that annoying thing where he Ozzy was never the, the greatest vocalist for coming up with his vocal lines so rather lazily he just sings what Tony plays so you know Tony will play and Ozzy just sings it to that you know he just sings the lyric that then gives her hands him to that melody you know has he lost his mind and, and you just think, you know, it wasn't until Dio came along and Geezer admitted it, that uh, Antony, that they went, God, at last, somebody that can actually come up with some vocal lines and kind of free us and let us do some instrumentation where we don't have to worry if they can sing along with it because they can come up with their own thing on top of it. Not to put Ozzy down, it's just that I think he'd be the first to admit that he's not, you know, well, no, he wouldn't be the first to admit that he's no Dio because Dio's name will probably never pass his lips, especially Sharon's beside him. Um, but he would 
probably admit that he's more of a, you know, he came from the clubs, he came from, came from the working background and things. Um, and, you know, he's a great Beatles fan and things. So, you know, he, he, 10 years earlier, Ozzy would have been in the clubs in Hamburg and things and perfectly happy. Um, so, yeah, I think um, he's, 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 um, he's great for what Ozzy needs to be. Um, which sounds like I'm damning with faint praise, but I, I don't mean to, because I, I do appreciate Ozzy, but, you know. Where am I next? Um, it's Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. I love, always loved that album cover. Um, distinct lack of logo that stuck with them at this point. I mean, look, the band name's even tiny there because obviously they've used the Sabbath word so much at the top. Um, this is where we start to get to me um, some really interesting stuff from Sabbath, where they start to show, oh, look, we're not just and look at that artwork as well. We're not just that evil band that your your mum told us not to listen to, um, and you know they start to become more lyrical, so they're showing off the lyrics a lot more, which is you know a sign of a band wanting to progress and wanting to be more mainstream. You know we're we're proud of the music and we're proud of the lyrics. We're proud of the presentation a bit more. It's not just you know evil and and, and I keep saying the word evil. I'm going to stop that now because it's a bit predictable when talking about Sabbath. But we're not just um, <coughs> evil. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, Sabbath by the Sabbath. Obviously, the title track itself is one of the great Sabbath tracks for me. I know Ingvi Malmsteen has um, cited it as as the track that made him want to reel again to guitar. So that is both a blessing and a curse. So we can thank Ingvi, uh, thank Tony for for inspiring Ingvi for you know the the early stuff, and curse him for turning that bloody later Ingvi on us because uh, you know. To think that he also inspired that kind of wanky guitar playing where it's about how many notes a second you can hit when that is so not Tony's style at all. It's like they, they were inspired by Tony and then completely abandoned everything that made them love Tony's kind of playing in the first place. I mean, Tony famously lost the top of the finger and had to find a way to come up with these power chords. Um, and from about this period he started tuning down his guitar which made them sound moodier and deeper, more involved, much, much, um, almost proggier, which again goes with some of the sounds that we're starting to experiment with. Um, and Geezer decided that he would down tune the bass as well, so he wasn't standing out um, too much. So it gave them a different sound and they were looking for a different sound as well, if that makes sense. So they would have one anyway, just with the down tunes. Um, but they were looking to find it. Um, so they got us with the title track straight away. National Acrobat's cool. Fluff is the um, the instrumental tribute to Fluff Freeman, the British DJ. Um, Cyber Cadabra, I've always, I've always thought that was um, a bit of fun. You know, the feel so good, it feels so fine. It almost feels like um, they're, they're getting a the chance to, to do a bit of a, the beatles -y stuff lyrically there, doesn't it? Um, but you know, side two opens with "Killing Yourself to Live," which, for me, is definitely one of the best Aussie era tracks. Um, "Who Are You," which, of course, uh, has nothing to do with the hookup. <laughs> um, "Looking for Today" and "Spiral Architect." Um, so all songs were were written and arranged by Black Sabbath. So at this point, they were still very much a band, which we're going to start to notice in the next couple of albums. Kind of starts to fade away. Um, Next up is Sabotage with that famously awful album cover where you go, what are they wearing? Bill's wearing his wife leggings, um, you know, everybody's having a bad day, you know, and then you get the bag there, but um, again, the logo comes back though, which I like, the, you know, the, the S there at the top. Um, right, this to me is, is one of the true gems of the Sabbath catalogue. Um, and probably my second favourite of the Aussie albums. Um, I mean, just these tracks alone to make uh, uh, an EP or, or one side of an LP would have been amazing. Hole in the Sky, Symptom of the Universe, Am I Going Insane, and The Writ. There's half a side of, of one of the best Sabbath albums. However, we do have a couple of... Hmm, Hmm. I'm not a massive fan of Megalomania. Um, don't start. It's cool, but you know, it's kind of. Hmm. 
Um, thrill of it all was a good opener to the second side. It starts to show you where they're heading, um, and you know, super czars. <laughs> Neither here nor there, but it is certainly a, a, a nice step away from where they had been. So with these two albums, they were very much signaling, signaling that look, we're more than doomy, um, aggressive, um, scary, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid evil, um, um, monsters um, that your, your, your granny would be terrified by. You can also take us to church. We might erupt in flames, but nonetheless. Um, and then this, the uh, the uh, next one, which would be the second to last with Ozzy until 2013, is, and I'm going to be a little bit controversial, this might be my favourite Sabbath album, not featuring Ronnie James Dale. Technical ecstasy, I think this is a masterpiece of um, production. So at this point... Um, Tony had had enough of the other guys just being late, you know, ripping the piss, and you know, saying no more. So he decided, right, I'm taking control of production duties, and by God, it works for the album because it's got a sound that is miles ahead of any of the previous albums, including these ones, even. Um, so Backstreet Kids is just a, it's a cool, yeah, maybe a little bit cheesy um, rocker, um, but uh, no wait, let's revert. Stop that, reverse that album cover, the Hypnosis album cover with the apparently is to symbolise two two robots simulating um, intercourse. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure about that one old stormy boy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I can kind of see it. So two androids or robots passing in the night on elevators and uh, how quickly, you know, you, they uh, can interact in a, an intimate fashion. <laughs> and then, you know, say goodbye to each other just as quickly. So maybe there's a subtext there about, about the nature of relationships. Probably not. Um, but yeah, Backstreet Kids is cool. It's a bit gimmicky, but it's a cool kind of, hey, we're still here and we're still rocking. And then we get the wonderful You Won't Change Me, which to me might be my favourite Sabbath song with Ozzy. I almost feel embarrassed saying this because it's so contrarian to, to most people's picks. Um, but You Won't Change Me has got a wonderful lush arrangement, but it's also quite terrifying. So on one hand, it's it's a, a, a slow, almost dirgy, um, I just want to be loved kind of song. But then on the other hand, it's saying, you're never going to change me, don't try, I'll destroy everything. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's quite down in itself. Um, it's very desperate, all these vocals on it. You know, I was saying Ozzy doesn't always come up with vocal lines. In this, what he does is much more proper. He doesn't come up with a vocal line, but he kind of hollers, and there's a desperation to that, which, which is just um, perfect for the lyric. I think he uh, found these lyrics really, uh, if not inspiring, then certainly relatable in a way that perhaps he had to fake a little bit earlier on, you know, to be, you know, consistent with the band's image and his image. Um, but you won't change me top tier Sabbath for me. It's all right, cool Bill Ward stuff. Um, Gypsy um, is one of 398 songs called Gypsy from the 70s that from classic rock bands that are all, all pretty good. Um, um, and, and Bill Ward sings all right, uh, doesn't he? He sings it's all right. Um, and I like Bill Ward's voice. He's got quite a plain voice, but it's a very relatable voice. It's a very... Um, um, but like Roger Waters, where it feels like a real person singing rather than the kind of technical perfection of someone else or the, or the oddity of an Ozzy Osbourne. So Bill sounds more like um, a regular guy singing a song, which is maybe not what people want from Black Sabbath, because they want a, a Dio or they want a you know Tony Martin or they want a Glenn Hughes, um, maybe not certain points of their career but um, they want a larger than life character and Bill's voice isn't that 
but I don't think the song would lend itself to that anyway. Um, all moving parts, Stanislaw, yeah, rock and roll doctor. That's where we go back to the more bluesy Tony Omi stuff. Um, she's gone. I really like. I know some people think that's a bit, bit of a, bit too slow for 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 Sabbath, but I think it's a good indication of of where they can go. And Dirty Woman is just another um, old school kind of Sabbath to try. So I think this is probably the best example of Sabbath, both saying. This is where we've been, but mostly this is where we want to go. Unfortunately, drug issues, band issues, meant that they wouldn't have long to go um, before change gonna come. Um, and we end up with the last album, another Hypnosis album cover, which I've always loved. Um, I think this is a really cool, almost spooky album cover. It's, it's almost... Um, uh, alien-like, I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's like an aircraft, but these, these do not look like, you know, US pilots or something, they look positively extraterrestrial. Um, so, Never Say Die has long been considered the black sheep of the Aussie era, um, even including the later stuff, you know, like uh, the couple of reunion tracks they did for the live album and 13. This has always been considered the lesser. I still like it. Um, I think there's some, some really good stuff on here. I like the title track. Uh, Junior's Eyes is a bit mockish for me. Uh, I like Johnny Blade. Um, that's where we start to get some, some kind of fun um, Sabbath ideas again. Um, Air Dance is, is a, you know, there's some fun instrumental there with Bill. Um, and Geezer and Bill really together get to get to do some cool hooky stuff. Uh, Breakout, Swing in the Chain, over to you. I think it's consistently solid. I just don't think it's what people wanted from Sabbath. I think if this had been released by, you know, insert band name here with exactly the same music on it, it might have done better with, um, you know, it probably wouldn't have done better because would it have held up on its own but it might have done better if, if you just had an objective listen to it without the baggage of the previous seven sabbath albums but i think that's quite a remarkable output for such a short space of time as we know what happened next was ozzy would be fired from the band because of just you know for him to be fired for drug issues is quite something because they all had them so that shows you how bad ozzy's were um but it was just so unreliable and they were seeing so little upside at that point that um, Ozzy was persuaded to leave, to put it mildly, um, and they kind of had a lost year, um, and then Ronnie James Dio recently left Rainbow, was asked to join the band, and they record Heaven and Hell, and A New Start for All, and by God, was that an album and a half, that's my favourite Sabbath album, so all due respect to these and again i think that the the hidden gem in the whole catalogue is te technical ecstasy but the best was yet to come not for long because as we know bill ward then decides he doesn't want to do the band without uh, ozzy so he chucks it um and in comes um well oh christ what's his name new york uh, drummer um apathy finny apathy um, and that lineup makes Mob Rules, another great album, and then they leave. Um, there's a whole dispute over live album. Uh, people are, you know, accusing other people of going in at night and having mixing battles where they turn themselves up in the mix and turn others. Bullshit nonsense. That lineup splits. Deal goes off. Ian Gillen joins. Ian Gillen then leaves to, to do the Deep Purple reunion. Glenn Hughes comes in for a Tony Omi solo album, which turns out to be a Black Sabbath album. Can you keep track? Then Glenn's so fucked that they get Ray Gillen in. Ray Gillen doesn't even make an album with him, he only does the demos. Um, so that was the same, um, the Eternal Idol, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and then Tony Martin joins the band and he's their kind of, uh, he's the kind of dependable uh, side girlfriend. 
they keep going off with these exotic models but then going back to, to Tony Martin in the late 80s, early 90s. So then a few albums in, Dio comes a calling again, they reunite the Mob Rules lineup, and then he chucks it because they decide they want to do a support act for Ozzy. And Dio says, no, I'm not supporting the guy that I replaced. That just makes me look like a, a cuck. Um, and then he leaves again. <laughs> Tony Martin comes back. They reunite with Ozzy for a like, few live shows. Um, and then that's it from Sabbath. And we get um, Heaven and Hell, the, essentially the Mob Rules lineup again in the 2000s, late 2000s. Um, Ronnie passes away. <sighs> Can you keep up? And then the original Black Sabbath announced they're re reuniting. So this original foursome all decided they're reuniting. And then it's announced that Bill Ward wouldn't be able to do it or wouldn't be permitted to do it, depending on who you believe. Um, and Ozzy's drummer would, would be in the band instead. So when they made 13, which was the final Black Sabbath album to date and I don't imagine we'll be getting one anytime soon although we are supposed to be getting a Tony Martin box set eh, which is overdue because there's some good in, uh, good stuff in his era but we've hit the half hour mark but I don't think that's too bad considering I've just done an overview of, of an entire era of um, a pretty iconic band so thank you very much for watching once again welcome to the new subscribers uh, thanks for sticking around to the old subscribers it's still relatively new. We've only been going a few months. It's all new. Um, so, um, for the people that have just joined, we tend to do box set Wednesdays and then just ad hoc reviews. At the end of the month, I'll do movie pickups and things. Um, any comments, suggestions, um, general mockery, stick them in the uh, comment section. It's the best place for them. I like the mocking comments and the snarky ones. I tend to have more fun with those, but I don't get them as much. Um, people seem to like me, even though I try and you know, isolate myself as much as possible. Anyway, you go off and do something more interesting than watching me. I am going to audition for G.I. Jane 2. And uh, do me a favour. Be very careful out there. Yeah? Be careful for me. Love and mercy, my dears. Love and mercy. <laughs>